It's all about the fiber, right? And the variety of fiber and everything that comes with it. You know, the American Gut Project a couple of years ago analyzed the gut microbiomes of 11,000 volunteers in high-income countries. The number one determinant of a very healthy and very functional gut microbiome with fiber-loving bacteria producing extra short-chain fatty acids was the diversity of plants in your diet. The people who consumed more than 30 different plants per week seem to unlock even more gut microbial benefits. But in that study, because it was performed in high-income countries, fewer than one in 250 people were making the grade to wow. 30 plants per week. Whereas as you know, on a whole food plant-based diet, on any of your meal plans, on the meal plans that are in my book, you're eating 50, 60, 70 different plants per week without even thinking about it. Season three of the Plant Strong Podcast explores those Galileo moments where you seek to understand the real truth around your health and dare to see the world through a different lens. This season, we honor those courageous seekers who are paving the way for you and me. So grab your telescope, point it towards your future, and let's get Plant Strong together. Welcome back to the Plant Strong Podcast. I am your host and healthy eating advocate, Rip Esselstyn. And as promised, we continue our lively chat with gastroenterologist, Dr. Alan Desmond. If you missed part one last week on the top 10 prescriptions for gut health, I highly recommend you go back and give it a listen. Gut health is finally having its moment and we are here to keep shining the light on its importance. Today, we do a deeper dive on the microbiome and explain just how and why all health, physical, mental, and emotional, starts in your gut. Let me ask you this. Where do you get your fiber? If your first answer is Metamucil or gummy bear fiber chews, keep listening, please. So many of us have what is known as a carcinogenic microbiome. That's even awful for me to say, but it's true. Many people are walking around with a gut filled with cancer-promoting cells. Not only is this leading to so many of the preventable chronic lifestyle diseases that are afoot today, but also debilitating mental and cognitive issues like depression, Alzheimer's, and anxiety. What you eat affects how you feel. My friends, we can do something about this. I don't want to depress you with this information, but instead empower you and provide simple solutions to reclaim your health and live optimally. And that's why Dr. Desmond is back today to continue to help you understand the importance of your gut microbiome allowing it to thrive and the massive impact it has on all aspects of your life. Are you ready? Let's get back to Dr. Alan Desmond. So you, you, in your book, you talk about a carcinogenic microbiome. Uh, what, what can we all do to make sure we do not have a carcinogenic microbiome? That just sounds Deathly. That sounds awful. Yeah. So the human gut microbiome, hundreds of trillions of microbes, bacteria, yeasts, viruses, archaea living within our digestive system. Yeah. 10 times more cells than the rest of our body, 100 times more genetic material. The human microbiome has been with each one of us since the moment of our birth. That first human touch, that little bit of breast milk, that, fresh bre that first breath of fresh air microbes from this microbial world find a home within our digestive system and within our body. Crucial to the development of a healthy GI tract immune system and body. Okay. Yeah. Not only that rip, because look, I, I, I'll try not to talk for another hour about the gut microbiome. Okay. But those little critters, those bacteria, viruses, and yeasts have been on this earth for two to 3 billion years. 
they are the direct descendants of the Earth's first living inhabitants. Humans, on the other hand, have only been around for 200,000 years. What that tells me is that when the first ever two cells got together, that would ultimately form the, the, the primitive creature that would ultimately give birth to the human race. The bacteria and the yeast and the viruses were there. The microbiome was there right alongside them and it's still with us today. And we, on a daily basis, we can take care of our gut microbiome because our gut microbiome is incredibly important to our health. And why wouldn't it be? It's been with us since the dawn of human evolution. So, I mean, how I would put this is, when you sit down to eat, you can think about what kind of microbiome am I building today? Mm. Because the foods that we eat provide us with calories and nutrients, we absorb those in our small bowel predominantly, but they, the foods we choose to consume define the residue that gets delivered to our gut microbes. So if you're eating a standard Western diet, which is full of red meat, processed meat, animal fat, plant deficient, processed food, okay, the bacteria that live in your large bowel are getting a steady supply of animal protein, hardly any fiber, and bile. They're getting bile, which is produced to help to digest and emulsify all that fat. And that feeds certain types of gut bacteria, causing them to flourish and become predominant. And those are the bacteria that process that stuff and generate things like secondary bile acids and ammonia, hydrogen sulfide gas, which is pro-inflammatory, um, you know, and hardly any short chain fatty acids. And that gives us a gut microbial environment, which creates barrier dysfunction, inflammation, DNA damage, genotoxicity. In short, a gut microbial environment that is conducive to inflammation and carcinogenesis, the mm. beginnings of cancer cells in our body. How about we make a different decision? So instead of having the Big Mac meal, we're having the bean burger and the sweet potato and the leafy greens, the whole grains, the vegetables, the fruits. So now what does our gut microbiome receive on this healthy whole food plant-based diet? Well, tons of fiber, no or very little animal protein, yep. less protein in general, because we absorb what we need and there's less left over. Hardly any bile acids because our whole food plant-based diet is naturally lower in fat and lower in saturated fat. So now we're choosing to build a different kind of gut microbiome. We are feeding the bacteria and encouraging them to thrive that take those residues and metabolize them and produce, you, you mentioned it, short chain fatty acids, antioxidants, phenolics, vitamins even. We get far less production of secondary bile acids and hydrogen sulfide gas. We get far less production of trimethylamine. Yep. In short, we have produced a gut microbial environment that promotes healthy cell metabolism, anti-proliferation, promotes mucosal health and defense. We have produced a gut microbial environment that promotes mucosal anti-inflammatory mechanisms and anti-carcinogenic effects. So on a day-to-day -day basis, Rip, we can choose what kind of microbiome we're going to build each day. It's incredibly powerful, the food we eat. And, and that all goes back to, I think, prescription number one, which is a diversity of plant-based foods, because you write about how um, our gut absolutely loves and adores fiber. Fiber... Yeah. It's all about the fiber, right? And the variety of fiber and everything that comes with it. You know, the American Gut Project a couple of years ago analyzed the gut microbiomes of 11,000 volunteers in high-income countries. The number one determinant of a very healthy and very functional gut microbiome with fiber-loving bacteria producing extra short-chain fatty acids was the diversity of plants in your diet. The people who consumed more than 30 different plants per week seem to unlock 
even more gut microbial benefits. But in that study, because it was performed in high income countries, fewer than one in 250 people were making the grade to wow. 30 plants per week. Whereas as you know, on a whole food plant-based diet, on any of your meal plans, on the meal plans that are in my book, you're eating 50, 60, 70 different plants per week without even thinking about it. If you know anything about my family, you know that we love to cook simple, plant strong meals. And I want to virtually invite you right into our kitchen with the plant strong meal planner. So many of my family's favorite recipes are right there for you to make for your own families or even make together like we do. Earlier this year, we launched a special promotion and we've been really surprised at how much you've enjoyed it. For the first time, we offered a 14 day free trial to test drive our Plant Strong Meal Planner so that you can come in and really kick the tires before deciding if it's right for you. Exciting news, we're bringing it back so more of you can take advantage. Simply visit mealplanner.plantstrong.com today and enter the code STARTFRESH to redeem your two week trial. Check out the database filled with hundreds of recipes, see instructional cooking videos, make and save personal menus, and shop using our adaptive grocery list. You can even load and save your own recipes so this meal planner becomes your wingman or wing woman in the kitchen, saving you loads of time and ensuring you use up all those vegetables. Again, free trial for the first time and for a limited time, go to the show notes or visit mealplanner.planstrong.com and enter the code start fresh. Yes, you have to enter a credit card, but you won't be charged if you cancel before the trial ends, and that's simply a click of a button. Enjoy the test drive and get cooking. And for the listener, you know, I mean it it and that counts as like nuts, seeds, you know, chia seeds, hemp seeds, flax seeds, you know, I mean it, it adds up in a hurry. Right. And that's up in a hurry. Absolutely. The seasoning, the flavoring. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I mean, I've almost given up counting the plants on my plate, but I do it occasionally. Yeah. And I just go, oh, yeah, well, I've got like 12 plants on my plate in one meal today. You know, so, so it's no surprise. The, the 28 Day Revolution meal plan in my book, I think people get an average of like, um, I think it's like 55 plants per week, you know? Yeah. And the, the, the nice thing is once you order those shopping lists, you see those plants coming in the front door, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, and speaking of, you've got about 80 recipes in your book. Uh, they look absolutely delicious. As a former firefighter, I was drawn to like the spicy uh, black beans and sweet potato uh, falls, far, far, well, F-A-R-L-S, what's that word? Far Farls. So that, that's based on an old traditional um, thing. It's an Irish thing. So it's just a, a, a very simple potato bread. So in the book, we use sweet potato and whole grain flour, and you just mix those together into this little dough, you flatten it out. And having that with beans is such a good filling breakfast. So delicious. Yeah. Um, and in the book, we do these lovely spicy beans. Yeah. Yeah. Great recipe. And you've got barbecue fruit. We used to love doing barbecue fruit at the firehouse. You've got a, a nut roast with an onion miso gravy that just like makes me just my mouth water. Yeah, it's good, man. It's so simple, but so good. Mushroom lettuce and tomato sandwich. Lots. Really, really creative stuff. Bob, and, Bob, Bob, Bob is a genius. Bob. So Bob Andrew, we've been friends for years. Um, he's worked at tons of restaurants. He's worked at a, an organic fruit and vegetable company for years. And, you know, when I met Bob, the first time I met Bob almost 10 years ago, I, 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 I thought me and Bob are going to do a book together one day. Yeah. And we did it, man. We did it. And one of, the, one of our golden rules when we were putting together the recipes was obviously the only to be healthy, whole food, plant-based. But also we avoided, very actively avoided using um, ingredients that might seem exotic or difficult to yeah. source to the average person. So look, I, I enjoy chia seeds, but there is no chia seed pudding in this book. Right. Because for most people, chia seed pudding sounds a little bit out there. Um, and we wanted this book to be very, very accessible. And the recipes are built from the ingredients that you will find at your average supermarket. You don't need to go to the health store. You don't even need to go to the healthy, 
you know, the, like the plant-based section at your, at your grocery store. You'll just find all this stuff in the, in the produce aisle and where the beans are at in the supermarket. That's where you need to go. No, very firefighter friendly. That's good stuff. I want to come back to uh, SCFAs, the, the uh, short chain fatty acids. So explain to, explain to, to the audience, are these created from the, from the um, <clears throat> basically the bugs? Is this a byproduct from the bugs? And then is this, or, or how are they created and how do they help us out? Yeah, so I spoke earlier about when we consume food, are, there are certain parts of that food that we don't absorb, yeah. okay? Um, like certain parts of the fiber and certain parts of proteins. And also when we eat food, there is also stuff that gets delivered to our large bowel that we didn't eat, but the reason it reaches our large bowel is because of the foods that we chose to eat. So for example, like bile, we don't eat a lot of bile, but if we eat a lot of fat, our body produces a lot of bile, which makes its way down to the large bowel. So these substances are food for our gut microbiome, to put it simply. So certain microbes can thrive by metabolizing fiber. Some of them can thrive by metabolizing choline or carnitine from red meat. Yep. Some of them can thrive by consuming bile, which we get when we eat a lot of fatty foods. So, and each, for, one, and each one of these that thrive on, let's say, choline or bile or fiber, it's a different type. Um, yeah, the, the, we've, we've probably got like 7,000 different types of bacteria living in our digestive tract, probably more. Yeah. And so different families of bugs can um, thrive on these different substances to a, to, to a greater or lesser degree. So what those bugs are doing is they're just trying to survive, Rip. You know, they're just, they're just digesting food as yeah. far as they know. But the healthy bacteria are the bacteria that predominantly thrive on fiber. And so they digest by a process called fermentation. So they get the nourishment that they need to keep them going so they can reproduce and duplicate and go about their business. Yep. So their waste product is something that we refer to as a postbiotic. Okay. Okay. And so depending on what we fed our gut bugs, those postbiotics may be short chain fatty acids, yeah. or they may be trimethylamine, or they may be secondary bile acids, or they can be a whole host of other, you know, thousands of different chemicals, including neurotransmitters and vitamins and, and other things. But I guess these are the ones that we mostly speak about because they're the most important to determining um, our overall health. And we know, Rip that if we take people who eat an omnivorous diet and we take people who eat a vegetarian or vegan diet, those, the people who eat veggie or vegan have a healthier gut microbiome. The, the, the research has been done. Vegans have a healthier gut microbiome. They produce more short chain fatty acids. The short chain fatty acids have so many benefits for our health. It's almost like our gut microbes want us to be healthy, Rip. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're sentient, but it's like they want us to be healthy. Those short chain fatty acids, which are made by our gut microbes, provide 70% of the energy to the cells that line our large bowel. Without a constant supply of short chain fatty acids, our gut lining becomes unhealthy and dysfunctional and leaky without this stuff that comes from our gut microbes. Well, and so, and so, and so do you think that's one of the reasons why, like when you started this podcast, you mentioned how you see Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and IBS and dysfunctional guts. Is, is this purely a function of people not eating enough whole plant-based foods that, that then their microbiome is not basically turning into, you know, SCFAs and then protecting them from leaky gut and all these other things. Absolutely. Diet is so important. We spoke earlier about creating a gut microbial environment that yeah. is conducive 
to inflammation yeah. or one that is not conducive to inflammation. Okay. So in, in terms of conditions like Crohn's disease, for example, there are, there is a genetic predisposition to developing Crohn's disease, but just because you have the genes doesn't mean you're going to develop it. Mm. And not only that, we know the genes associated with Crohn's disease. And while they increase your risk of developing the condition, they do not define the disease severity. Environmental factors are what define the disease severity. And the number one environmental factor is the food that we choose to consume. So we know, for example, data from the States showing us um, the nurses' health study showing us that nurses in the nurses' health study, so healthy middle-aged women predominantly, who consumed the most fiber, which, okay, it's standard US, so it's like 28 grams, okay? It's probably, you have this much for breakfast, but even consuming 28 grams of fiber per day substantially reduces your risk of developing Crohn's disease. We see data from France showing us that women who consume the most animal protein are three and a half times more likely to develop Crohn's disease. Is there a certain number of grams of fiber you like to see your patients consuming over the course of a day? Yeah, I mean, generally, when I speak to my patients, I don't talk, I, I genuinely don't talk to them about individual nutrients. I don't, I don't talk to them about carbohydrates or oils or fats. I don't even really talk to them about fiber. Right. I talk to my patients about food. I talk to my patients about fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes and nuts and seeds. And I, I think that's how we should be talking to our patients about their dietary intakes. Um, I talk about the diversity of plants aiming for more than 30 per week because yeah. the fiber will follow. You know, the fiber will follow. I, 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 I try to keep it really simple for people because if, if you start talking about grams of protein and grams of fiber and grams of fat, you've lost the conversation straight away, right? Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with everything you just said. I just find it like, like you said, when you started this out, 28, most, I think you said women in the UK are getting 28 grams. So that's the recommended daily allowance. I have that for breakfast in my big bowl cereal, right? Yeah. I mean, I've never counted it up myself, but I bet you I'm getting somewhere between 75 to 100 grams a day pretty darn easily. And, and yep. the reason I bring that up is when I wrote my third book called The, Eng the Engine 2 Seven Day Rescue Diet, right? Use the word diet like you use the word diet. Uh, I did a pilot study in Mesquite, Texas with 65 people. And I asked them, I said, uh, this is before they started. What's the number one way that you get fiber into your, into, your, um, into your diet, into your lifestyle? And guess what the number one answer was? Number one answer was Metamucil. And then number two answer was gummy bear fiber chews, right? They, they didn't even think to put like, you know, plants. So uh, I'm just, you know, like you said in the beginning with protein, you know, most people are deficient in, 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 in fiber, you know, and that's not protein. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, I, I think, you know, the, the evidence, I mean, if we look at some of the healthiest populations in the world, if we look at the people who don't develop these diseases, generally we see populations who are consuming, you know, up to 60 or 70 grams of protein. You've got me doing it now. 60 I to 70 grams of fiber per day. But I think generally the evidence would suggest that if you are living in the US or the UK, and if you make a change to your diet, whereby you are getting like 50, 50 grams of fiber per day, and you're eating a diversity of plants, and you're eating your fruits and your vegetables and your whole grains and your legumes, and you're finding meals that you enjoy, and this is sustainable for you, you are on the right track. But, but that's what the evidence tells us. But I, I tell you, look, over the years, I've been involved in designing quite a number of whole food plant-based meal plans, okay? For my patients, for the online courses I do with Stephen Dave at The Happy Pair and Rosie Martin, registered dietitian, for the book and for other projects. Yeah. And you've seen the recipes in the book. We were talking about them earlier, okay? There's, there, there's nothing, you know, we've got like, I've got the book here. So rosti pie with cabbage, uh, spicy parsnip and lentil soup, chunky minestrone, uh, baked kedgeri, breakfast oats smoothie. You know, th this isn't exotic food, okay? And generally in the meal plans, these are the kind of meals that we have. And on each occasion, we've run the numbers 
um, usually with my friend Rosie Martin, who's this awesome plant-based dietitian, because we know that people who are embarking on this meal plan will need to know that they are getting enough fiber and protein and calcium and iron and copper and magnesium. And more importantly, as health professionals, we want to be able to stand over it and say, yes, this is a complete diet, okay? Mm -hmm. We've never had to tweak anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean it. We have never had to tweak anything. We have never had to scratch our heads and go, oh, hang on a second. Can we get more protein into one of these recipes? Or can we get more calcium into one of these recipes? Because if you follow the general principles of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, leafy greens, nuts, seeds, legumes, just like the Eat Lancet paper report recommends, then all of those nutrients just take care of themselves. So we don't even need to talk to our patients about them. We yeah. just need to talk to them about food and give them recipes and give them cookery lessons. And, and, and the, the rest just takes care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Cookery lessons. I like that. So let me ask you this. Will you explain for, for us the, the gut brain connection? Oh, this is so important. So in my book, I talk about this as the happiness effect. And it, it's so important. And really, the reason I became so interested in this was just like you, Rip. I've been privileged to help lots and lots of people make the switch to a whole food plant-based diet. And whatever their motivation, whether it was when we were doing the Southwest Plant-Based Diet Challenge, we had like 150 health professionals trying a plant-based diet for the first time, just because they, because I, I told them it would make them healthier and they wanted to experience it for themselves, or whether it's patients looking to improve their digestive health or individuals looking to reverse their type two diabetes, whatever the reason, if you're doing it for ecological reasons, animal welfare reasons, if you're just doing it to help prevent the next pandemic, right? No matter why people have made the switch, when you check in with them after about four to six weeks, they say, how's it going? How, how are you finding it? They always say things like, I feel lighter. I feel happier. I feel more cheerful. I had a friend recently who's a chef who's been eating a kind of a, kind of a low carb animal heavy diet for a while. And he switched to a whole food plant-based diet. And after a few weeks, I checked in with him and he said, you know, Alan, I'm being nicer to people. Mm. So there is this happiness effect that we see all the time. And maybe it's because losing weight and getting all those other health benefits just cheers you up. But actually, there's some really good science telling us why eating a plant-based diet makes us healthier. And some of it is to do with the fact that we're reducing our consumption of things like advanced glycation end products and ar arachidonic acid, which are inanimate products linked to causing chronic inflammation, which causes depression. We're eating more antioxidants, which may improve our mood. We are eating a higher carbohydrate meal plan, whole carbs, which yeah. helps to favorably affect our body's metabolism of tryptophan, a substance which our brain uses to make the happy hormone serotonin. Nice. Right? So serotonin, the happy hormone. And we know the studies tell us that the more fruits and vegetables that people consume, the higher their levels of optimism and psychological stress and lower risk of depressive symptoms. But we talked earlier about how our gut microbes produce postbiotic substances, mm -hmm. yeah. which benefit our health or affect our health. Our gut microbes also produce and respond to neurohormones like serotonin, dopamine, GABA, and norepinephrine, which enter our bloodstream and affect our health and happiness and well-being. We talked about short chain fatty acids earlier. Okay. Those short chain fatty acids that are manufactured by our gut microbes when we consume a whole food plant based diet, that's how we preferentially hook in to maxing out our short chain fatty acid production. 90% of those are absorbed very quickly and enter our bloodstream. Now, we already know that they help to reduce chronic inflammation control our blood sugars, and all this other good stuff. Last year, I read a paper demonstrating that butyrate, short-chain fatty acid, is also present in our cerebrospinal fluid. 
So this is a chemical that's made by our gut microbes when we consume porridge or fiber, and it's in our brain, Rip. And I was like, what is it doing in there? It's got to be helping us. It's got to be benefiting us because it helps our physical health. It's got to be protecting our psychological health as well. And I was speaking to our mutual friends, Dean and Aisha Shirzai recently. Yes. And I, I said to them, I said, guys, what is it doing in there? I haven't seen the research. And Dean tells me that the research shows that the short chain fatty acids play a crucial role in helping the gut brain barrier to maintain its integrity. So this is a barrier, excuse the, the brain blood barrier, okay? This is a barrier, just like the gut barrier, but in our brain, which prevents toxins in our bloodstream from entering our brain and causing damage. Like Alzheimer's. So, like Alzheimer's or, or, or any um, inflammatory condition, right? Yeah. So can you think of like a more elegant description of how our gut microbes are so crucial to our health and how we're just one big organism? Phenomenal. It is truly phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can see, I mean, as, as uh, someone who went into gastroenterology, how fascinating it's like you have, you have found the um, you found the missing piece of the puzzle and it's been there all along. <laughs> Yep, absolutely. Since the dawn of human civilization. Wow. Wow. Well, let me ask you this. What are you most excited about right now going forward, Dr. Oh, my Dr. goodness. I, I'm super excited that the book is out in the US. Like genuinely, um, I, it's already helped a lot of people on this side of the pond. I think it's going to help a lot of people on that side of the pond as well. Um, I'm super excited to be an ambassador for Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. Um, I'm super excited to have built a network around the world to have incredible colleagues like Dr. Neil Bernard, um, Dr. Kim Williams, Dean Anisha Shirzai, Brenda, uh, Brenda Davis. I'm so pleased to know these people and to count them as friends. And what I'm really excited about is as the world opens up again, Rip, that we can start to have conferences again and spend time with people again. And, you know, like a couple of months before the pandemic, I had lunch with Dr. Michael Clapper in a busy diner in London after a conference. You know, making these sorts of connections in person is what I am truly looking forward to again. Nice. Well, That's what's got me excited right now. Yeah. Well, I look forward to meeting you in person when the opportunity presents itself. Oh, I can't wait. It's got to happen, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, Dr. Alan Desmond, thank you for your contributions. Thank you for doing everything that you can to propel the plant-based diet revolution. Your book, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous, it's informative, it's educational. Uh, it is going to help people and save lives, no doubt about it. Um, all right. Will you sign off with me? Peace. Yes. Let me, sorry, I just missed. I missed my cue. That's so right. it's peace, peace, just, just and me. kale, right? <laughs> no, just just follow me. Ready? Peace, peace. Turn it around. Engine two. Engine two. Keep it plant strong. Keep it plant strong, my friend. Thank you so much, Dr. Alan Desmond. These last two episodes have been really, really fantastic. Again, his book, The Plant Based Diet Revolution, is available in the U.S. now. And we'll have all the links in the episode page at plantstrongpodcast.com. This book and the information in it can change your life in so many ways. And I hope that you'll join this fast-growing revolution, the plant-based revolution. It is on. Thank you for listening to the Plant Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. Have you had your own Galileo moment that you'd like to share? What happened when you stepped into the arena and shed the beliefs that you thought 
to be true. I'd love to hear about it. Visit PlantStrongPodcast.com to submit your story and to learn more about today's guests and sponsors. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.